hosted by the ANCC Advanced Practice Initiatives Group. My name is Elizabeth. My name is Elizabeth Walters. I'm the Associate Director of Advanced Practice Initiatives with the ANCC, and this is our series called Advanced, uh, focused on advanced practice providers. We're really lucky today to have um, Sherry and Amelia here to talk about latest issues facing transition to practice. Go ahead, Sherry. Oh, sorry, I have to review the continuing nursing education information. Um, in order to receive your CNE, participants must attend the live webinar presentation in its entirety and complete the post-webinar evaluation. An email with the evaluation will be sent post-presentation, which must be completed no later than August 25th of 2023, so no later than one month from today. You will then be provided with a certificate for your records. We, the American Nurses Association, is, a, is an accredited as a provider of nursing continuing professional development by the American Nurses Credentialing Center's Commission on Accreditation. Go ahead, Sherry. Well, good afternoon and good morning for some of you, depending on where you are in the United States, and maybe we have some international friends here today. I am Dr. Sherry Cosme, and I'm joined with one of my esteemed colleagues from Memorial Sloan Kettering, Amelia Cotolado, and I totally just butchered your name there, Amelia, I apologize. And we're here to talk to all of you about transition to practice for APPs. I have the objectives up on the screen here today, and we're hoping to hit all of those, as well as some of the questions that many of you posted um, in the pre-registration um, questionnaire of things that you'd like us to hopefully address during today's presentation. So I am gonna dive in and talk about APP practice and transition of practice programs within our world. As many of you know, hopefully out there, you're going to learn very shortly, APP transition of practice programs have been around for over 20 years. Um, one of the first programs that ever came into existence was in 2002 out at the Leahy Clinic, and it was a dermatology program, um, and they are proud, um, proudly accredited program here by the ANCC. Since 2014, the American Nurses Credentialing Center has been recognizing advanced practice provider or an APRN fellowship programs. And in the last two years, we've actually expanded the depth and breadth of that recognition program to include PAs as well into our accreditation process. So I'm going to take you on a little journey here where Back in the beginning of 2022, the ANCC created an APP task force to look at our APRN standards to see how we could widen our accreditation lens to include PAs. And I'm honored to have some amazing leaders across the United States that joined us in this work. I'm happy to say that an output of our APP task force last year was our new credentialing product within the ANCC called the Advanced Practice Provider Fellowship Accreditation or APFA for short. And wouldn't you know that today is APFA's first anniversary or I like to consider it its first birthday. And it's an honor and privilege to get to speak to all of you about this great work that has happened within the APP space. Which I didn't play my cute little video here. Gotta love a gift. So, what is APFA? What does this all mean? What does it mean for your healthcare organizations? And so I have shared a QR code on this screen for you to grab a download of our manual so you can read it tonight or at your leisure and kind of figure out what kind of what standards um, frame up an APP fellowship program. Currently within our APFA program, we have three newly recognized programs, one being our wonderful program at Memorial Sloan, which you'll hear a little bit about soon. And we have 16 programs that our applicants are on the journey of receiving this recognition within the next, I'm going to say, eight to 12 months. And so one of the questions that came in earlier today was, well, how many programs are out there? And I will say within our wheelhouse, there are less than 20 under APFA. But with our sister program, PTAP, there are about 26 APRN programs that have been recognized by the ANCC. It's important to know that there are other credentialing agencies out in the world that are credentialing APP fellowship programs, specifically CCNE, 
the APP Consortium, as well as the ARCPA, which some of those organizations might be familiar to you. And if you were to total up all of our programs that are recognized by those four credentialing agencies, it roughly makes up a very small subset of the number of fellowship programs that are, that are out there. And I wanna say it's averaging around 60 accredited programs across the nation so far. But that's not to say there aren't fellowship programs in your backyard, or maybe there's a fellowship program that you're hoping to start at your healthcare organization, which will add further availability for those new graduate NPs that are coming out of practice or PAs that are looking for an experience, as I like to say, to sharpen their tools and their toolkits that their academic preparation has prepared them for to be the most amazing critical care nurse practitioners or emergency department um, PAs, et cetera. So a little bit about APFA. APFA is built on the Dreyfus model of novice to expert, where the goal is every single PA and APRN that comes into practice is entry level competent. They have passed their boards, they have passed their um, preparation for academia, but they probably in many cases need to sharpen their tools in their toolkit to be that super spectacular NP or PA that you want taking care of your loved ones um, in your healthcare organizations. We have five domains that make up the APA standards, which then have standards underneath them. And I'm just gonna walk through what these domains mean because as you look at these building blocks, you will see what it takes to have a robust, well-run APP fellowship. The first domain is program leadership. Within any APP fellowship program, you need a strong leader that is accountable for the residents or the fellows, or as I like to say, learners that are part of your fellowship program. They interact with the key stakeholders, they are accountable for that financials of running the fellowship program, and they are, I'm going to say, the person that everyone goes to for this APP fellowship. Program goals and outcome measures is what I like to consider the North Star. What is this APP fellowship program trying to prove and what is it trying to accomplish? So is the goal in your organization to retain these individuals? Is it to grow the capacity within cardiology and PEs across the nation? What are the goals of your program and what are those outcome measures that you're using to determine if you're meeting the goals or not? Organizational enculturation is what I like to think of as the vaccine or the goo that you give that individual that makes them excited to be a member of your healthcare team, to be a member of healthcare in general, to be passionate about the work that we do day in and day out, and to make them aware of those foundational documents that all of us practice under. Development and design are basic educational design principles. Who's teaching your program? What are the competencies that you want your learners to attain by the end of their fellowship experience? Who are the preceptors that are going to be encouraging them to, um, to encourage them to reach that level of competence that you need them to be at in their subspecialty or specialty area of practice? Who are their mentors that are a part of your fellowship program? And what does the curriculum look like? Are you having them do specialty rotations? Are you having them um, focus in just one area of your healthcare organization? Or are you giving them that wide 360 look? And then last but not least is what I consider the boots on the ground learning that every single learner goes through in a fellowship program. This happens in the clinical learning environment. How are you enriching your fellows to be amazing practitioners where they have fantastic communication skills, they're able to critically think on their feet, they are demonstrating professionalism, they have those key components that make you proud to be a colleague with them, and what does that experience look like during the duration of their fellowship? It's important to know that these domains make up a larger subset of standards, and we're not going to dive into the standards because we don't have enough time to talk about every single standard and its meaning, but I encourage you to download our manual and to take a look at those standards, and if you're interested in other accrediting bodies, download their standards as well because I know they're all freely available on the web. You can do a quick Google and be able to find each one of those standards so that you can take a peek at them. 
When an organization chooses to go through a credentialing process, specifically here at the ANCC, there are some steps that you have to follow. The first step is the application process, which means that your organization has to meet the eligibility requirements outlined in the manual to before they can apply. Our Commission on Accreditation appreciates and understands the hopes and dreams of organizations, but the reality of a, a program that has actually completed or run a fellowship cohort must first be in existence before you apply for accreditation through the ANCC. I do know that several of our colleagues at other accrediting bodies do allow programs to seek accreditation prior to running learners through the program. But our belief here at the ANCC is that you learn so much during your first cohort and your second cohort of a program that we want you to pressure test your fellowship program before seeking accreditation because there are so many changes that happen within your fellowship program, specifically in that first year or two. Between phase one, applying and submitting your self-study um, submission is you actively writing to each one of the standards that is outlined in our APFA manual. This work happens on your shoulders only and hopefully the members of your team. This is work that us here at the ANCC, we cannot help you write your self-study. It's something where you are proving to us that you are saying what you're doing and that you're living up to those standards. Typically between an application and a self-study submission date is roughly four to five months where you are actively engaging and writing up your stories of how you're meeting each one of the standards. Once you submit your self-study to us here at the ANCC, it then gets processed and pushed off to a team of appraisers who within this APFA program, there is always a PA and an APRN assigned to each appraisal review. And that dyad of individuals then reads your self-study, scores your self-study, and actually asks you probing questions when they have points of clarification that they need or for, before formally interviewing you on the virtual visit. During this phase, it takes roughly from self-study submission to going through the virtual visit process about eight to 10 weeks, depending on your schedules, because you dictate what dates you choose for your virtual visit. Concurrently, as the appraisers are reviewing your documentation and asking you those clarifying questions, you are then required to deploy a survey to your learner so that we can garner their perceptions of their experience through your fellowship program. And this is a way for the commission to see a 360 view of your fellowship program so that they have as much information as possible to make a decision, ultimately, hopefully an accreditation decision where they are rewarding you accreditation. The final piece is that decision, which happens through our Commission on Accreditation and Practice Transition Programs, which is a volunteer group um, that works with the ANCC PTAP and APFA team. Our commission is currently made up of 15 amazing nurses, advanced practice providers, as well as PAs, and I do have a pharmacist, pharmacist on our commission who are all experts in transition to practice, and they are the ones that have that ultimate decision-making power bestowed upon them from our ANCC board of directors. Myself and the team that works with me are the ones that interact with you as applicants throughout the process and your, in your pre-application journey, but it's truly the commission that makes all of our accreditation decision, decisions and sets our standards. Because I can't take up many hours of your day, um, I do want to make sure you are aware of some, I'm going to say a deeper dive into the APFA program here at the ANCC, and we do have an upcoming information session that I encourage you to register for where I will do a much deeper dive. But if you're looking to go swimming in the deep end with me and really dive into these credentialing standards, we do host workshops um, that go through all the eligibility requirements, all of the standards. You get to network with colleagues from across the country and form those relationships. And we do host workshops. Um, and Caitlin in her post 
con or post webinar debriefing, we'll send you all um, some of those links so that you have them available to you. But I am honored and privileged to let all of you know that one of our, actually, they are our first accredited um, program is here to share their story and their journey with you. And so I am going to give the floor to Amelia for them to tell your story. And I hope you enjoy what they've gone through. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sherry. Um, so as Sherry mentioned, my name is Amelia Cataldo. I am the manager of the Advanced Practice Provider Fellowship Program at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, which is located in New York City. And um, I'm very excited today to share with you a little bit more about um, our program here at MSK and also our journey towards APFA uh, accreditation. Um, today I'm presenting on behalf of myself and of Nicole Zakak, who is the Director of Advanced Practice Provider Professional Development here at MSK. So to start, we've actually had an Advanced Practice Provider Fellow um, in existence at MSK for over 40 years. Um, initially, we had advanced practice provider fellows that started in our hospice and palliative care department, and then um, slowly throughout the course of the years, and really in the last uh, two to three years is when we built up our program, and now we um, are very happy to report that we have over 20 fellows each year and 10 different subspecialty learning tracks that the fellows are eligible to apply to. When we were growing our program, um, it was really formalized into the structure that exists today in uh, 2020. And the program was grown to address a gap in um, APP education for nurse practitioners and physician assistants. We were recognizing that many of these APP programs don't really take a deep dive into oncology education, which could present for a challenge when some of these uh, new to practice uh, nurse practitioners and physician assistants are entering into the oncology field. Um, so this was designed as a program to really facilitate um, a more comfortable transition and to grow really strong uh, APP clinicians in oncology. And um, our hope is that many of them will choose to stay here with us at MSK, um, but many um, may choose to go to other institutions. And with that, we know that they are carrying with them this robust education from their time that they spent learning with us. And um, at the beginning of the development of our APP fellowship program, a literature search was done to evaluate what other APP fellowships were out there already being developed in um, you know, the country so that we could have a look at what how other institutions have chosen to structure their programs. And we use this as a foundation for how we built our program. Um, after we really took a deep dive into this literature, we then worked to engage key stakeholders at our um, institution, which for us includes um, primarily our vice president of advanced practice providers, our group of APP directors and managers, and then also um, key leadership within the different clinical areas where we were looking to um, have this subspecialty training. Um, once we identified where um, we were going to be growing these subspecialty tracks. We then did a needs assessment to evaluate what the learning needs would be for fellows as they uh, went to these different clinical areas. So the 10 different subspecialty tracks that we currently offer are critical care medicine, geriatric oncology, hematology oncology, hospice and palliative care, neurology neurosurgery, pediatric hematology oncology, perioperative and specialized care, psycho-oncology, solid tumor medical oncology, and surgical oncology. So each of, the, each of our fellows are enrolled in one of these subspecialty tracks, and they're all united by a core oncology curriculum. So everyone is here to learn about the oncology spe specialty and then choose a subspecialty learning area within one of these uh, you know, 10 distinct tracks. Here you'll see our organizational chart. So um, at the top, we have our vice president of APPs and then our APP director of quality and professional development, who's Nicole Zakak, myself, the APP fellowship manager. 
And Nicole and I both serve as uh, APP Fellowship Program co-directors. And then for each of the 10 subspecialty areas that I mentioned, we have a fellowship coordinator who oversees the experience of the fellows throughout the course of the year. And they're responsible for um, being a mentor for the fellows, for overseeing their progress and um, providing their evaluations throughout the course of the year and ensuring that they're meeting the standards that we've developed uh, for our program and that they're on track to successfully graduate at the end of their fellowship year with us. And then our fellows, as they're um, rotating through their different clinical experiences, are taught by preceptors and clinical champions in the different clinical subspecialty areas that they rotate through. So within each of the tracks, there are different um, clinical areas that, that our fellows will learn in. So if we take, for example, our hematology oncology track, the fellows rotate to both inpatient and outpatient leukemia, inpatient and outpatient lymphoma, inpatient and outpatient myeloma, bone marrow transplant, et cetera. And as they're in each of these areas, there are uh, champions and preceptors to help guide their experience. All of our um, preceptors, champions, and coordinators are asked to attend our preceptor workshop so that they have a clear understanding of their roles and expectations. And then new this year, we built in the role of a chief fellow. And this is a fellow that has graduated from the previous class and they serve as an additional layer of support for our um, fellows and um, help engage as a mentor for them and also serve as a liaison between our learners and a, um, APP fellowship leadership as well. So a little more about our uh, curriculum. We uh, welcome new graduate and experienced nurse practitioners and physician assistants. We actually have a fair balance of new grads and those that have worked in other uh, clinical areas, other fields as NPs or PAs, and are now looking to gain um, specialized oncology experience and therefore are choosing to do our fellowship program. Um, the program is 12 months long. Everyone has, um, you know, graduated from their APP programs. They have passed their boards and have licenses to work in New York State. And we have our program um, run annually from October through October. The whole year long program is a precepted learning experience with understanding that the goal is for our fellows to really progress towards more independence as they course through the year and go to their different rotations. Our fellows are all fully credentialed. Um, they are able to do advanced privileges as um, appropriate for the clinical areas that they work in and they're all able to bill as well. And um, this picture here is highlighting one of our APP fellows who is um, at one of our skills days and is learning how to do a bone marrow aspirate. So for our curriculum, um, again, as I mentioned, no matter which subspecialty track the fellows are in, they're all united by a core oncology curriculum. So every month they come together for didactic learning as an entire fellowship cohort. And then their clinical rotations are where they learn their subspecialty um, skills and knowledge. We also build in simulation exercises and um, skills days as well so that they can um, have an opportunity to learn as a cohort and gain broader exposure to um, all areas of patient care. Our fellows are engaged in giving various presentations throughout the year and also um, work on many different projects. The big project that our fellows work on is a quality improvement project. All of our fellows are expected to uh, complete a QI project by the end of the year, and we have a guided curriculum to help them understand and learn about quality improvement. And they're all given mentors to help them navigate the QI process. And these mentors are APPs at the institution that um, either have their DNP or have successfully undergone QI training through MSK and um, are qualified to guide a QI project. We do allow the fellows to work in groups on these projects, and um, we encourage them to select projects that are of special interest to them so that they feel um, you know, fulfilled in the work that they're doing. 
we have our fellows presenting case study presentations, journal club presentations. They're involved in the book club as well. And then you'll see it listed on the right here, some additional learning experiences that we invite all of our fellows to include our grand rounds, town halls. Um, we have them joining in ethics and open forums. We have many different uh, CME programs here at MSK that are driven by APPs that we have our fellows attend. Comskill training is a special communication course that we have them participate in, um, NPPA and APP week activities. And then each subspecialty um, clinical area has many uh, different opportunities for subspecialty specific lectures um, and other learning opportunities as well. All throughout all of this, because as you can see, this is a pretty robust curriculum, um, we really want to make sure that we're paying attention to the well-being of our fellows as well. So we do build in resiliency training and help them um, build a skill set to, um, you know, help maintain balance in the work that they're, they're doing. There's a lot of growth that happened during this year professionally personally, you know, clinically. And so we have a robust support system as well to really um, keep an eye on how our fellows are doing as they're coursing through the year. Um, as I mentioned, we are very happy to retain many of our fellows as um, they're coming upon their graduation from the program. Anyone that's in good standing within the fellowship program is eligible to apply for any open job opportunities here at MSK. Our APP managers are very um, happy and excited to hire fellows. You know, they really see the value that the fellowship brings in helping our fellows to become well-rounded clinicians. As I mentioned, they rotate through many different clinical areas and um, get a very broad exposure to um, the systems. They meet a broad network of uh, people here at the institution and really come out to be strong um, APPs that can progress through our onboarding phase much quicker. And they have an APP that's able to join the team and be up and running uh, much faster than someone who uh, would be hired externally and um, be entering the role from, from that being a starting point. Our fellows um, work on average about 50 hours a week with about 40 hours of that being their clinical rotations and training, and then 10 hours set aside as protected didactic time. So this didactic time is um, reserved for working on the different projects that I was mentioning, also uh, preparing for clinical rotations, reading articles and reviewing resources provided by the preceptors, champions and coordinators. And then some of our didactic days, as I mentioned, are set aside for that core oncology learning or for our simulation and skills days. And you'll see here um, a picture of our fellows engaging in one of those simulation sessions. We do offer our fellows a competitive stipend. They're paid biweekly throughout the year and also are provided with core benefits. And then um, something that's new this year for our incoming class in the fall is um, we were able to advocate for subsidized housing for our fellows. And um, now all fellows will be eligible to apply for housing as well, which we think will be a great um, benefit for our program. So I'll share with you a little bit about our journey towards APFA accreditation. Uh, we were very excited to hear of this new accreditation when it was released last year, and we were eager to submit our application on October 3rd. Um, we quickly found out from APFA that we were accepted to move forward in the process, that we had met the initial criteria, and we then began our self-study um, phase. So as Sherry mentioned, this was about three or four months long for us, where we really took a deep dive and reflected on how our program met the standards of um, APFA. I think there were 42, if I'm remembering correctly, within the different domains that Sherry highlighted. And um, we worked to find uh, clinical exemplars for how we were meeting these standards so that we could um, not only describe, but also demonstrate that we were living and breathing and doing the things that we said that we were doing to meet the standards. Um, so we put together our comprehensive self-study um, and submitted this document on February 1st. And then we moved into the appraisal review phase. Um, and actually, step four is what was completed um, next for us, which was our learner survey in which our um, current and 
previous fellows completed a survey reflecting on their experiences within our fellowship program. And this was part of the appraisal review um, process. And we were excited to have our virtual site visit occur on March 10th. And um, for this, we invited many different key stakeholders from our fellowship program. So we had our vice president of APPs there and myself, Nicole Zakak, um, different APP managers, our um, fellowship coordinators, preceptors, presenters for didactic day, current and past fellows, our chief fellow, et cetera, who all were able to um, really speak to uh, their experiences with their fellowship um, program and um, help to, you know, really bring to life the work that, that we were doing um, and, you know, make it uh, highlight all the things that we had uh, introduced in our self-study submission document. We then um, were very excited yet also anxious to receive news that our decision call was scheduled for April 24th, um, 2023, so just a couple months ago. And we all joined in together as we received uh, the news from Sherry as to whether we had been granted accreditation or not. So you'll see here um, in the upper left corner is myself and Nicole Zakak as we're uh, hearing the news virtually from Sherry. And we were most excited and delighted and, and proud, ecstatic to announce that we um, were granted accreditation. And um, not only were we granted accreditation, but accreditation with distinction, um, which we were most honored to receive. And we were the first, first program to ever um, be granted this APA accreditation. So you'll see in the uh, lower right corner, many of our current fellows cheering as they learned the excited news. We had a room packed with um, APP managers and directors, our um, uh, vice president of uh, APPs, our chief nursing officer. Um, we invited the president of the institution. Everyone was most delighted to hear the news. And I'll actually share with you a video of us uh, receiving the, the good word from Sherry. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Sherry Cosme, the director of ANCC PTAP and our newest credential, the Advanced Practice Provider Fellowship Accreditation. Today, the commission met to discuss your program. It is an honor and privilege to let you know that you are the first APA accredited program with distinction from the ANCC. Not only did we receive accreditation, but we received accreditation with distinction, which is the highest honor, and I could be not be more proud of our team. It puts our APPs on the map in a way that we weren't before, so it's really exciting to be here with all these people to share in this honor today. Um, so as you can see, there was so much excitement in the room and, you know, I think we still are riding the high from, from that news and we can now proudly share that uh, we are, we have reached accreditation and accreditation with distinction. The APA team was absolutely fantastic in helping to guide us through the process and um, we could not be more thankful to have the support and, um, you know, all the excitement around uh, our journey and sharing our experience in our program and um, we're happy to answer any questions that you may have. 